to contend with very uncontrollable spread of fire. And one of the things Jeff mentioned to me early on that has always stuck with me is, is um, mice in fields, right? So there will be this field fire, their fire will be all consuming. Of course, there are critters that live in the fields. Every once in a while, you'll have one of them catch fire and take off running, which now spreads fire, right? And this week, as I'm reading this chapter, I'm thinking to myself, we've got the gospel of Jesus Christ going every which way. And I'm trying to imagine what the organized church or the insiders must have been thinking and feeling as, as this stuff just explodes and word of Jesus Christ just takes off. Okay, so we're in that setting right now. And I think it would be helpful for us to think about some contextual things. I know that we've been working through Acts. So I'm going to ask some questions to help us build some context for where we are. We might have one foot in um, previous chapters of Acts. Um, so let's just think about what we've been reading. And then I want to ask some foundational questions about today's lesson. Okay. What do we know about Philip? Let's start there. What do we know about this guy, Philip? There are some interesting clues in the passage right before today's passage, right? We see Philip in Samaria, right? But what do we know about Philip? What can you tell me that you know? What was he doing? Anybody? What was Philip doing? Walking. He's traveling, right? We know he's a traveler. He's not hanging out in a church waiting for people to come him right, to him, right? Philip is on the move, okay? So he's traveling. He has a journey going on. What else do we know about Philip? What's he doing? He went to Samaria. He went to Samaria. Okay, that's important. Is is do you is Philip a Samaritan? What's who is Philip? Disciples, right? Probably Jewish, right? Okay, what else? What else do we know about him? Connect to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he's got a connection with God. He's listening. He hears. He, he's, he's, he's got instructions, right? And he's healing. He's casting out spirits. Yes. Uh, Healing cripple, paraly paralytics. Yep, he's healing. He's casting out spirits. He's got he's got some powers, right? We know that. Simon is amazed by this, right? And he's like, "Hey, how do I get that? Can I buy that?" Right? What else do we know about Philip? He built the one who Jesus shows the Father. That's the one time Philip speaks in the yeah. Gospels. He says, I want to see. Show us the Father. Okay. That's capital. Which kind of speaks to his level of connectedness, right? This guy isn't just, he's, he's not a casual kind of guy. This guy's on the move. He's taking God with him, right? He's going into Samaria. He's proclaiming, he's healing, he's he's doing wonders. Okay, right? Okay. Anything else about Philip that you want to add? All right. What do we know about Samaritans? We, we get to the good Samaritan. There's all kinds of stuff in the Bible about Samaritans. And we just kind of assume Samaritans are, are the, the bad people or the dirty people or the others or whatever. But what... How did the Samaritans get started? What do we know about the Samaritans? I think this is important for this message. Yeah. So the, the, when Israel got taken down into Babylon, they were the few that got left over and they intermarried with the local people. And so therefore, the, for a good Jew, they looked down on them. So they intermarried. So they're mixed race, right? Samaritans were the 10 tribes, right? The 10 tribes that took off on their own. 
right? Remember, there were two, were two tribes that stayed in Jerusalem. They were conquered by Assyria, the northern kingdom. And then Assyria transplanted the, the Hebrews from there further, further east. And then they brought in other people to settle the land. Yep. Those people ended up being attacked by lions. And they were like, we're being attacked by lions because we don't know how to worship the God of this place. So they contacted the Assyrian king and said, hey, we need to know how to worship this God. So the Assyrian king moved some Levites back okay. to the northern kingdom to teach them about Jehovah. So they ended up accepting that, but also mixing it with some of their pagan practices. That's right, because they got that from the Assyrian king, right? Right. Where was Jerusalem in the lives of the Samaritans? Was that their temple? No. They built a rival temple. You remember that? The woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well was like, which temple is the real temple? Yeah. Is it the one you say it is, or is it the one up on the mountain oh, that we built, go. right? So they built their own temple, okay? Is it fair to say, well, and the Jews despised them. The Jews ignored them. Didn't want. They didn't want any Samaritan help when they were rebuilding Jerusalem. They, the Jews, as we recall from the Good Samaritan story, the Jews did not find them at all palatable and did not mix with them. Is that correct? Remember that? They're, they were like the equivalent in Adventism of an offshoot who <laughs> claims to still be Adventist but to be doing it right. And we're like, no, you're not. My, my son-in-law this week said, this would have been like the civil war with the North and the South. Like this would have been, th these guys would have been considered for like the Union soldiers, like the Confederates. Yeah. These guys were not. They were worse than a foreign enemy. They're the ones that claim to be us, but we know they're not. And so we're going, stop using our name. Stop saying you're worshipers of Jehovah. Cease and you're, desist. You're, you're the worst. Yeah, they would have put out, the Jews would have put out a PR notice that said, those aren't us yep. at all. We don't have anything to do with those people, right? Okay, so those were the Samaritans. And here we find Philip traveling into Samaria, right? Interesting. What does that tell us about Philip? I don't know. Yeah. So where did Jesus go to begin with? He went down to Samaria. He met the Samaritan woman, and then the whole area already had an understanding of what Jesus was about. Right. So I understand Philip would say, well, this is this is the place to go. Jesus already showed us this. By all accounts, and what we read with where Philip has been and how he's behaving. Philip is a pretty serious Jesus follower. Philip strikes me as I'm following the example and I'm doing what I'm told. Does that make sense to you as you read this? The, the last time that we see Philip in Samaria before this was toward the end of Jesus' ministry when Jesus chose to travel through Samaria. This was a different trip than the woman at the well. But they're traveling through Samaria, and Jesus sends a couple disciples ahead to a Samaritan town to ask about food and water. Water. They they get insulted. They come back to Jesus, and they have just been empowered yep. just before that to heal and to work miracles. And the response of the disciples, seemingly very seriously, they ask Jesus, "Hey, let us call down fire and burn them up." Yeah, the disciples are like, "Are you serious?" And and. I mean, I think they're serious. They're not far from Mount Carmel. They they remember God like filling with fire. Yeah. You know, like sending fire down, and they're like seriously asking Jesus, Jesus, let us burn them up. Yeah. Philip's and, learned some lessons yeah. from this, right? Because he's back. Yeah. He's back in this place that is no bueno for Jews. Unclean messy, um, distasteful. Philip might have felt the pressure of possibly being called one of them or associated with one of them or mistaken for one of them. All kinds of complicated 
potential here. But yet we read this story and we're like, oh, Philip went to Samaria. That's great. And he preached and he won people and he baptized. Fabulous. But when we sit deep into the story and try to understand who Philip is and what he might have been wrestling with as he's on this journey where he now in our today's passage meets the eunuch, Philip's got some chops. Philip is just trying to do what he's seen modeled. He's heard and seen, and he's like, okay, listen and go where you tell me, right? Okay, so then now we get to today's passage. Who talks to Philip? Where is Philip getting his direction in starting in, in um, 26? What's happening with Philip? Angel. angel. An angel. An angel spirit, right? We see angel, we see spirit talking to Philip in this passage, right? Philip is dialed into something not human, not of this world, okay? And he is told to go meet a eunuch. What do we know about the idea of a eunuch? Well, it's a little strange topic. Torah says that they're to be excluded from the assembly of believers. Yeah. Deuteronomy 23. Yeah. You get to Deuteronomy 23. Eunuchs are not. I'm sorry. They can never. It doesn't matter. Because of their physical status, they are automatically excluded. According to Deuteronomy. And if you're a Jew and you're following the Torah, if you're following all of the rules and regulations, eunuchs are not. They can't. They're not included. So. Excluded. That's big time. It's 23, right? Yeah. All right. So eunuchs are not, that's not happening for them. What else do we know about the eunuch in this particular story? Yes. Often very close to power. Yes. Why is that? Because they can't be threatening to the family line. They can't threaten the family line, right? Oftentimes, eunuchs were assigned to the women, the queens, the mother, right? They handled money, right? Probably, be, probably uh, rose to their official status because they were really no threat in society. Does the eunuch have potential to leave a legacy, a long legacy? If you're in, if you're, we've already read through the gospels and in Jewish culture, who you begat, who begat, who begat, who begat, your lineage was a big deal, right? Does the eunuch have that potential? No? No legacy, right? What else do we know about the eunuch? Is eunuch smart? Eunuch educated? Okay, this is an educated fella, right? We know that because he was reading. He had a lot of authority. He had some authority. Yeah, he probably had he had a carriage. He was wealthy. He was wealthy. He was in charge of the queen's finances. Where was he from? Ethiopia. He was a foreigner, right? He was a foreigner. What was he doing in that neck of the woods? <laughs> really? Well, a thousand years before, the queen of Ethiopia had come to Solomon to, you know, to seek wisdom. And at least the Ethiopian uh, Orthodox Church claims that she converted to Judaism at that time and, and so had some followers. And he apparently... Uh, you know, was amongst those and yeah. uh, was returning on a sort of a pilgrimage, if you will, to Jerusalem. What would it take for you to hop into a horse-drawn carriage and go several hundred miles over about two months to go to church? <laughs> That's kind of what he did, right? He was some sort of believer. 
he was enough of a believer that he went on a pilgrimage pilgrimage that was no small task. This wasn't like, hey, I'm going to go up to, up to, on the other side of town for a couple of weeks. This was a serious haul for him in a carriage. What, what kind of believer do you think he might have been to do that? This was some time, too, time away from his job. Uh, if he wasn't personally wealthy, he was using his 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 roy the royal uh, servants and the royal carriage. This this was an important and really big deal trip. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to mention he's uh, reading and not understanding Isaiah sixty, but he said that Deuteronomy speaks against him. But in uh, Isaiah fifty six uh, verse four says, "For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath." and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give mine house, and within my walls a palace, and name better than sons and daughters. There may have been, yes, there there was obviously some grace extended from the Lord, because this guy felt like he, he, he could believe, right? He felt like he could be included. He had headed to Jerusalem, <clears throat> right? Yes. So books are handwritten that day. And how does he get a hold of a book of Isaiah? He must have had financiers or some influence. Somehow he, he had the pearl, uh, spend his money on the pearl. So he could he try to understand. He has a scroll. Yeah. 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 Did they wear certain kind of clothes or how would you know that they were? That's a good question. What I find fascinating is that the Bible doesn't, this story, Luke does not identify him in any other way. How many times is the word eunuch used? We totally get it. Okay, Luke, we know. Right. Luke's hitting this home over and over and over again. He doesn't have a name. He's, he's not called a royal treasurer. He's not called the treasurer or the assistant of the queen. Or the, Luke is very clear. Eunuch, 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 eunuch. Not really a name that someone we would be excited to be known by, right? But yeah, he, we don't, we, we don't really know much. I mean, yes. Well, my understanding is that most eunuchs came to this truly. They were probably eunuchized, if you will, neutered at, at, at in the early teens at the latest. Most of them would then be boy sopranos, if you will. So it'd be fairly obvious by their voice, if nothing else, and also the development, lack of a beard, all those kinds of things would be fairly obvious. Good to know. Good doctor. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, good to know. Man, this is tough stuff. This guy, this guy obviously was wealthy, obviously was educated, right? Obviously had position. But on the flip side, had a physical physical uh a physical condition that may or may not have been his choice likely not i don't know i don't know how that went but that would have excluded him right interesting fella for <laughs> philip to meet on the road interesting contrast to the other group that we just discussed that philip spent time with who is Philip spending time with? Getting proud? All right. What do we know about Isaiah 53? We see here in Luke, I mean in Acts, Luke includes the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. Luke wants us to know what the eunuch was laboring over to study. What do we know about Isaiah 53? which is the where this passage comes from. Let's turn to there. Grab it on your phones. Because this passage is an excerpt from a declaration. What is Isaiah trying to tell us about what the eunuch is trying to understand? I'll read some of it. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God smitten by him, afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. He will see, of his, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of this soul, his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous service, servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What is this passage telling this eunuch? Imagine, we just now described who this eunuch might have been. Looking at this passage, what is this saying? Yeah, it's answered in Acts 8, 34 and 35. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet, of himself or of some other man? 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began that the same scripture had preached unto him Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, the triumphant Messiah who came and conquered? Is that what we read here? What do we read here in Isaiah? Yes. So if you look at Isaiah 53, 4, it says, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Mm -hmm. And then we go on, yet we considered him stricken by God. Now we did. So was he really? I mean, that becomes the issue. Is he really stricken of God or do we consider it? How does Christianity look at it? In general, what happened to Jesus at the cross? Do we agree that God struck him down for some reason or do we have trouble with that good question what do you think why did jesus die yeah that, i mean that would be the question right I did, yes thinking about the eunuch reading this passage it seemed like an awful lot of the very so i think he might have read it and thought who is this guy? Is he here for me? Yeah. Who is this guy? Yeah. James. James and Glenn. No? No. So we're looking at a passage that gives us two choices. How do we look at God's law? We look at it as an imposed law like we've grown up with the idea that if you break my rules we have penalties you drive too fast i give you a fine if you're a very bad person i put you in jail and if you're super bad and killing up people i'll probably get rid of you we have all sorts of rules and this is the way so does god work that way or does god work and, and this would be my question here with design so design law would be things like, uh, if I put a plastic bag over my head, what's gonna happen to me? 
that run out of oxygen. If I run out of oxygen, I die. Uh, laws of physics, gravity. The law of gravity says that if you step off the building, you're 20 stories up, probably not going to turn out too good. But I can say I don't believe in that law. When I step off the building, what happens to me? It still has the same result, right? So the question in, at, that came up uh, by Lucifer, he said to Eve, you will not surely die. He's basically saying God's a liar. But if he does kill you, he'll, he'll do it because he's mad at you, because that's a penalty. Versus God saying, no, if you separate from me, it's a law of life. And I'm the eternal spurs of life, you'll die. But yet, I know that that's the law of life. That's the law of design or the, the perspective of design. Mm -hmm. And yet we have a God that says, I've got to find a way to circumnavigate. I, I've got to find a way to as much as possible extend that law of design. So, so how does he show the law of design with Jesus' death? Because that's what it's saying here. We considered him smitten of God. Was he really? Or did Jesus say to God in uh, John is it 10, my father loves me because, let me read it to you and see what you think. This is John 10. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. You know, we think about our kids. You want your son or daughter to lay their life down for you. That kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. I got my son sitting behind me and I'm not, you know. <laughs> yeah. You no. Know, okay. My father loves me. Is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. And he makes a big statement here. Nobody takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Really? Now he's talking about his father, too. Father won't take it from him, but he's asking for, you know, he's saying to God, you need to take it because it's a demonstration here. We need to show the universe what it's like to be let go. Let's show the universe what design law is like. So let me ask you a question. Based on what we know about Philip and based on what we know about Samaritans and the eunuch, and as Darren pointed out, the spread of Judaism right? Conversions of people, mixing of people and Jew, Jewish practices mix, mixing with pagan, paganism. When, which, which side of that two-sided hypothesis do you think Philip, I'm sorry, do you think the eunuch was raised to believe? Why do you think the eunuch was puzzling so much over this text? Why was he not understanding this text? What would have been the lenses that were clouding his understanding of Isaiah 53? See, I think imposed law is what he was struggling with. He had just been to Jerusalem, right? We don't know how included he was, but he yeah. was there. You got to wonder how that went. How did that go? Yeah. You had to wonder if he was, he was going to show up and do the best he can with whatever they let him do in Jerusalem, right? We know Jerusalem, they were holding on tight for the ride, right? After Jesus' death as the, the word of the Lord, as the gospels, the Jesus, uh, the news of Jesus was just bursting on the scene. How do you think the eunuch interpreted what he read here? What was the big puzzle? Yeah. Well, I think... He, he probably had been excluded or treated as excluded. And so then as he's reading this message, he's wondering, is it refer to me, somebody who's excluded? How am I included in this kingdom? How is this kingdom going to be given? You know, at the end of, the, of the, that passage, it talks about all the things that this, this excluded person is given by the Lord. And so I think he's wondering, how does it apply to me as he reads it? I think it's it's also interesting because here, you know, Isaiah, this is Old Testament, but yet it's a, it, it's a prophecy and, and, and the prof, a prophecy fulfilled at this point. And and so I think Philip comes and, and explains it to him. And, and it, it's a perfect segue for him to say, guess what? This new church, it's for all of us and it's for you, too.
And so I think that, I think then he's like, baptize me, I'm, I'm ready. Yes. Yeah, well, he didn't know Jesus because as I read, Philip opened his mouth and said, uh, who speaks to this, the prophet? In other words, this applied to Isaiah himself or someone else that the iniquity of the whole world is laid upon him. After his reading these down. Might, he, might the eunuch have understood the history that might he have understood the Messiah to be the powerful king that was going to come and liberate all the Jews and pull perhaps the eunuch was in the same camp as some of the Jews. Perhaps the eunuch, his proximity to power and kings and queens and his money and his wealth, perhaps he was wondering, I don't know, might he have been wondering if the Messiah, the king of the Jews was going to come and unite everyone and what that was going to look like. I don't know, I'm hypothesizing, but we know that in the Gospels, the Jews were very, very uh, bewildered because Jesus wasn't taking the throne, right? Perhaps the eunuch was saying, this, this does not seem to me like a triumphant Messiah who's going to win. I mean, it's prophesied that it happens, but you read this, and this is grisly. People despise, this isn't a dude who is, is going to assume the throne and power by vote of the people. People don't, this describes someone that is despised is outcast. Do you think the eunuch might have been a little confused by that? Yes. Um, as far as we know, in fact, we do know um, that whatever scroll he was reading off of wasn't separated into chapters and verses, right? Right. Um, so I think it's logical to assume that they didn't, they didn't stop at the end of Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. And that they kept reading. And you look at the subsequent chapters, they're just some of the most beautiful promises that have like this kind of almost kicking the doors down, like expansiveness. And all these people who didn't used to be included are now. It's wondrous. And 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 like the the free nature of it. I mean, Isaiah 55, come all you are thirsty, come to the waters, you have no money, come by and eat. And buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what is not satisfied? This is here for you. This person in Isaiah 53 that lays himself down, that the result of his sacrifice is just like all these beautiful things. And you get to Isaiah 56 and you think, boy, how would this speak to this guy? Isaiah 56 too, where it says, Blessed is the one who does this, the person who holds fast, keeps the Sabbath, and so on. Verse 3, let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people, and let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. This is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to the covenant. To them I will give within my temple the place that they're supposed to be excluded from. Um, and its walls, a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. You will not be forgotten. You're, You're not excluded. You're not a throwaway. You have a legacy. Yeah. Yes. I'm just find it difficult to put words to a thing to say. But let me try. <laughs> Been suggested that there was a tension in chapter 53 between the Balkans and the principles that govern relationships. Is the law something we do by design? Or is it something we become because we're in love with our maker? That design concept is there. You don't behave to earn, gain, or qualify for anything. We become like whom we are in love with. We hold him to become changed. 
in the language of Isaiah 53 with the language of relationship to be. And it's saying, if you behold me and you follow me, you will become like me and belong to me. So I, I see the tension resolved when we see it in the light of becoming and belonging. I'm not trying to understand the way the design is, even though that's really it. Relationships are built by, if you look at the Ten Commandment Law, for instance, the Ten Commandment Law tells us what the holy boundaries are to foster relationships that can be eternalized and not just transitory. He says if you choose to live in harmony with the principles of my beautiful law of love, your relationship will last forever. And I kind of like that good news. This, you have provided me welcome. I like that you're here. <laughs> Come back. Um, you have provided me an excellent segue. I'd like to get into some questions now. We've asked some questions. We've sort of taken a little bit of a deep dive into the context of who's involved in this, right? Let me ask a first question. What was proclaimed? We know that Philip was traveling. We know that he was on a journey and he it says he was proclaiming. What was he proclaiming? The gospel. What does that mean? That's good news. That Jesus became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of his father. Jesus took it for us. So we can what I'm saying be included. We're in. Yes? Is that is that shorthand? We're in love. Okay. Anything else? What else was being proclaimed? Must have uh, must have been pretty good news. He was baptizing people. I mean, this is like wildfire, right? Messiah. All right. That's my first question. My second question, who was this proclaimed to? Sort of talked about it already. Oh, Philip was proclaiming it to those who were normally excluded. The normally excluded people? Everyone. Gentiles. And we've talked about why that might have been, right? Why Philip? Why Philip? Did he have? What did he have that lent him? I mean, obviously there were a couple of things. He was hearing something. He was being told what to do, right? But why would he be the perfect candidate for this? We talked about it a bit ago. He had seen Jesus do this. He had been in Samaria, right? He understood what was happening, what Jesus was trying to do. We are all in. Philip was a natural choice for this. He had the background. He understood. He had seen and learned. Okay? So Philip was proclaiming to the normally excluded. What does that tell us today? Yes. I can, this is kind of a yes and no in this normally excluded because this the primary uh, focus was still to the Jews, whether it was the ten lost tribes, the um, the Jews of the diaspora. Um, you know, it, it was still at this focus primarily, as I understand it, to the Jews, and even this Ethiopian eunuch. At this so, bit of Jewish some heritage. background, yeah, he knew. 
He went to Jerusalem. There's some reason he, he had a relationship somehow, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, here and then here. And, I mean, we talk about this today, and I think exactly the same in this. What is church supposed to be? A hospital. Who? Hmm. I mean, we're all sinners. We are all in need. No matter who you are, there, in a roundabout way, there is no remnant. There is no, well, they don't need God. Well, they've made it. I haven't ever found that, and that won't be until Christ comes. I think you're talking about wholeness, right? Healing is one way to say it, but wholeness. It's interesting that Isaiah talks so much. You see language of healing. You see language of injury, of hurt, of healing. And, and, and here this eunuch is reading this. Somebody who perhaps doesn't necessarily completely feel whole. Maybe he doesn't necessarily. He looks perhaps around society and thinks, I'll never have Not that. worthy. Have, yeah. Not worthy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I kind of, I mean, this, the shift though started when Jesus went back up to heaven and he commissioned his disciples wasn't to continue to spread the gospel to the Jews. It was to go, it says, you know, to go to Samaria, go to all Judea and go to the uttermost part of the earth. So Philip was doing what he had been commissioned and told to do, which was no longer just for the Jews. Jesus told them, go beyond, go further than that. That's terrifying if you're a Jew, right? Right. If you're a Jew and you realize that Jesus Christ himself is saying, go talk to those people. <laughs> it's a little unnerving if you're sitting in the next door to the temple and you realize this is going all over the place. Back here and then Yeah, here. I was just going to say what Sister said when he gave all the disciples the gospel commission in uh, Matthew uh, 28, 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and so forth. And I see Philip going through the same development Peter did when he denied Christ three times. And in John uh, 14, 9, when he says, show us the Father, that suffices as Philip, Christ said, have I been so long a time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And then shortly thereafter, Jesus was crucified, and he watched all that and realized he was a true Messiah, and he had seen God. What a realization, right? And he went and did what Stunning. Christ asked him. So what does all nations mean? Darren, I'm coming right back. All nations, it's really easy to say, I need to go to a mission trip to Thailand or Tibet or whatever. It's all nations. Is, is all nations really just geographical? If we look at Philip and kind of what he was doing, is it really just geographical? Here. Yeah, I think uh, what was just mentioned there is so essential to understanding this whole thing. I mean, there are two perspectives, the Ethiopian, the excluded one, and the, the Hebrew from Palestine, from birth, by the time he was 12 years old, he had to have memorized the Torah. Yep. He knew exactly what Deuteronomy 23 said. He could keep the Sabbath. He knew he was supposed to be excluded. What did it take for someone like him to when that Ethiopian said, there's some water. Is there any reason why I shouldn't be baptized? Yeah. Philip has the Torah memorized. He knows that in Deuteronomy 23, there's a big reason. Yeah. And yet he looks at the water and goes, nope, no reason. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. What, what, I mean, something happened, and it happened with Peter with the vision of the, you know, the sheet coming down with all the unclean things and take eat. And he's like, I have not touched an unclean thing since my birth. And he hears the voice of the Lord saying, don't call something unclean that I've declared clean. There is like su su something like radical that's happened here that the followers of Christ are having to realize how, how doors have been kicked down a 
curtain has been torn away from the most holy place, when Jesus had told the woman at the well, a day is coming and soon, where this question, this theological question you're at, asking about which place is the right place to worship, irrelevant. irrelevant. It, and, and it's here. And man, like understanding what it took for these Jews, followers of Christ, to, to, to let go go of their exclusivism and baptize Samaritans and eunuchs right. and everyone else. And that's my point. Philip had to have some chops. And and what, what does it, I mean, if we were to take this to heart, who are, who are the people who we feel like fall outside the walls? Yeah. Who, you know, if we were to have Peter's vision, who'd be in that sheet? I have two more questions. It's a great question. Two more. Why does God need Philip? We read previously in Acts 8 that Philip baptized people, but they didn't receive the Holy Spirit until Peter and John show up, right? But why, did, why is Philip even needed here? What could be the reason that we see Philip and these encounters? In Acts. Yeah. Well, for one, the eunuch was going to go spread this information to Ethiopia. Yes. Could God have done that another way? I, I mean, I think about this. Like, how many of you have ever made cookies with little kids? <laughs> Man, it lengthens the process. And it's messy. Am I right? If you want to get cookies done, the last thing you want to do is invite all your children to come in and help measure. <laughs> right? I often wonder that. Like, does God feel like he's making cookies with us? <laughs> I mean, this is, the, this is the creator of the whole universe. This is the God that picked Philip up, evidently, and transported him somewhere else instantly. Like, think, why, why does God need Philip to have these conversations? Yes. Well, just what happened with the eunuch uh, when he said there's water here in uh, verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he, he had it. Is there, something, is there something important about saying something out loud to another human? Remember your first crush that you ever told anyone about? When you say it, it becomes real, right? That's a really vulnerable thing. I like to think that sometimes we're needed to codify stuff, to, to, to help make stuff real for other human beings. Yes. So when you talk about making cookies, C.S. Lewis says he commands us to do slowly and blunderingly what he could do perfectly. And in a twinkling of an eye, he allows us to neglect what he would have us do or to fail. Like, he talks about that same thing. Yeah. There's something important about having another human involved here. And maybe even a lesson for us. Could Philip be a lesson for us? We don't go on long journeys. We're not, you know, as near as I can tell, not all of us are evangelists. But yet we're each on some sort of journey every day, right? Could Philip be a model for us that would have been missing if God had just taken care of it? Yes. Oh, you were just saying something about God can create the whole universe. Why does it need a human to do something? Reminded me of, I think it was a Paul Harvey story of an old farmer and the geese that got, I think it was geese that got distracted on a flight during winter and they landed on his farm. And it was like, I opened the barn door for them. I'm trying to shoo them in, but they're not listening. If I could just become one of them and tell them in geese language, hey, the barn is warmer than standing out here, they would understand. Um, yeah, maybe we're pre or maybe we somehow, maybe, maybe some of us need other humans to interpret God for us. Yes. Just a suggestion. Maybe it was something that God wanted to accomplish in Philip. Given what he was going to do later, he yep. was called in the ministry. And it wasn't that God needed Philip to do it, but that God was at work. Was being prepared. 
part of his regimen, yes. Part of it is, I think, what's the best way to learn something yourself? <laughs> Teach someone else. Practice makes perfect. And when you, I don't have any kids, but you have kids, and the way that you, they grow and learn and become an adult and self-sufficient and everything is learning, is practice, is following what other people do. <clears throat> okay, final question. I know it's fine. Final question. What should we, the church, we individuals in this room, learn from Philip's methodologies <coughs> today? Now, did Philip establish a church with that eunuch? Did he give him a code of all the honorable things that he should be doing? What does the Bible tell us happened there? Was it, what did, did he hang out and say, all right, now here's, here's where you should go to church and here's how this will work. And what, what, what does the Bible tell us happened? Philip did what? And then what happened? What did the eunuch do? Jesus. And then he baptized them. And then what? And then, uh, did the eunuch have to go back to Jerusalem to find Jesus? Remember, the Jews pretty much felt like the Jewish temple, that was the spot where all the important stuff happened. Where did the eunuch go? He went home. Did Jesus go with them? Yes. He did. He left him in the hands of the Spirit. He left him in the hands of the Spirit. So dangerous to leave a young Christian on their own, Jesus. How will they know what to do? <clears throat> How to be? Through study of the word. What can we learn about how this went down? Philip listened, right? He obeyed. Did he overshoot? He did what he was told. He spoke to the questions that the eunuch was asking. He listened to the eunuch. He didn't show up and say, they come to my meetings. Yeah, let me and let me tell you how this is. You know, it's like the the question that the man was asking was what he spoke to. Listen and obey. Answer their questions. Um, there's a difference between let me tell you what you need to know and what would you like to know. Yes. Showing love, which was Jesus' ultimate command, uh, and uh, resisting judgment, which is God's, God's realm. Swallowing hard, right? Doing the hard work of, okay, this, <clears throat> this may not be what is nor normal, but this is where I am. Show kindness, grace, love, ex 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 inclusion. Okay, what else? Anything else? What can we learn? I kind of like that Philip was on his way to do other things. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that Philip had decided he was going to go and figure out who he needed to talk to. The Bible says Philip was on his way to do something else, and God said, hey, go over there and do that. I went, okay. That kind of frees me up from creating operational plans. It's <clears throat> Identifying target audiences that I need to go after. Kind of put God puts God in charge, right? I feel like I can learn from Philip that if I'm connected enough, if I'm listening enough, if I'm focused on Jesus, whatever assignment comes will come. I don't need to make stuff up. I don't know. That's that was my take. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, I'm just gonna say, well, if the angel speaks to us as it does Philip, we ought to pay attention. And he went along, and he didn't start spouting off information to this eunuch. He listened. Ah, what are you reading? Do you understand that? We can teach. He was teaching. And then he gave his own testimony of Jesus. He became the son of God hung on a tree. And so he had all that information to share with him. Yeah. 
You notice that Jesus also started his ministry by asking questions about where people were. I don't know. I find that heartening about Philip. I like Philip. I think Philip is probably one of the people I'm going to look up in heaven. He'll probably ask me what I want to know. Right? <laughs> yes. Final word. Final word. I, I just like the, the part where it says that uh, uh, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away. So did he, you know, like Jesus, they showed up on the other shore immediately. Yeah, I know. You see, I mean, talk about the reassurance in Philip's life. Yeah. That what he was doing, what God yeah. wanted him to do. Yeah. I was really like, I was like, what does that mean? Does that mean he was transported? Like, how would that, you know, and then I started to think about it. And I thought, you know what? The most important thing is that God did not need him to hang out there very long. God, God had it covered. He didn't need Philip to hang out there and make sure this guy got it right. He did what he needed to do. And he was, he was out. There were other plans for the unit. Anyway, all right, well, we're a little bit past time. Next week's Bible verse is 9, 1 through 19, so I hope to see you there. I don't see Lois Blackwell there, so I'm going to call on my uh, fellow colleague who has blessed us with his historical knowledge today and ask Darren to pick us out of this wonderful South School. Is that all right? Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for the sunshine today. Oh, we've been craving this. And thank you for your word and the chance to gather around it and around um, your life and the example of your followers to, to uh, follow a little better ourselves. Uh, help us to do that, Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Merry Christmas. You know that the sunshine and the Sabbath. And whatever comes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.